It's August 1st, 2012. It's Paul Joseph Watson, and this is InfoWars Nightly News. Coming up on the show tonight. Tonight, Iran says expect war within weeks as the Iranian War Council prepares for retaliation against what they expect will be a major conflict with the United States. Then, busted. A Photoshop forgery is used to sell the war on Syria. Plus, ABC's new drama demonizes militias. And NATO says we need to attack Syria to fight Al-Qaeda. Al-Qaeda, that is. And finally, author and investigative journalist Dave Krieger joins us in studio to expose the mortgage scandal created by big banks. All that and more up next on the InfoWars Nightly News. Top story tonight. Coney 2012 style PR stunt to sell war on Syria. A mercenary who was previously embedded with US troops and also fought with Libyan rebels is set to produce a documentary film in an effort to propagandize for the invasion of Syria, drawing his inspiration from Coney 2012, the infamous viral video that drew widespread criticism for its role in using manipulative techniques to grease the skids for US military intervention in Africa. And this is on Infowars.com today. So we have our next potential, Jason Russell. You know, he of Coney 2012, naked mania meltdown fame, set to launch this new public relations hoax to convince the world of the sanctity of the glorious Al-Qaeda-backed Syrian rebels, half of which aren't even Syrian. And he goes by the name of Matthew Van Dyke. He's a 33-year-old American filmmaker who was embedded with the US military in Iraq and also fought on the same side as Libyan rebels, who of course themselves were commanded by Al-Qaeda-affiliated forces in the guise of the LIFG. So, you know, he, he was actually also imprisoned by Gaddafi for six months during that conflict, but he did such a fantastic job of helping to bring freedom to Libya, where out-of-control sectarian thugs now roam around imprisoning, torturing, and killing black Libyans in their thousands, you know, where the Al-Qaeda flag flies high over Libyan courthouses, but he's now keen, this filmmaker, on giving Syria a dose of the same medicine. And he's actually out asking for donations. He wants to make anything up to $100,000 to create this documentary film that will generate, quote, in his words, a public relations campaign, end quote, to sell global opinion on the need to basically increase support for the Al-Qaeda-backed Libyan rebels in overthrowing Assad and greasing the skids for this NATO military intervention. And in his press release, Van Dyke actually mentions by name Coney 2012, says it's basically the template, and that he wants to use the same techniques and promotional methods to sell his film about the sanctity of the glorious Syrian rebels. The problem with that, of course, is, as we documented at the time, back at the start of this year, Coney 2012 was widely derided and debunked because it was basically a PR stunt. It used emotionally manipulative techniques, dumbed down propaganda to whip up public support for further US military intervention in Africa. It was a trick, it was a stunt, and it was uh, generously supported by all the trendies on Facebook and Twitter which is why it went mega viral, you know, over 70 million views on YouTube. But when they actually showed Kony 2012 to Ugandans, you know, the supposed victims of Joseph Kony, despite the fact that Kony hadn't been in the country for six years, didn't mention that in the film, kept that quiet. The, re the reaction from the Ugandans, they rioted and started throwing rocks at the cinema projection screen. So even the very people that it was supposedly aimed at helping in Uganda could see right through it as a propaganda stunt. And of course, you had the infamous mental breakdown of the director, Russell himself, you know, his infamous naked drug-fueled mania. 
And now we've got a, a template of that for Syria with this Van Dyke character who says he's going to do the same thing. $100,000 to create a viral propaganda film to sell the NATO war on Syria. And what's he trying to accomplish? Well, he tells us in his own press release, he plans to portray the Syrian rebels as, quote, in a very human, moving and distinctive way. Now, that's despite the fact that the Syrian rebels and their al-Qaeda commanders with NATO there and special forces on the ground have been caught in massacres, bombings, and just over the past couple of days, summary executions of captured prisoners. So they're the people who he wants to portray in a human, loving, moving way with this Coney 2012-style propaganda film. So, you know, as the, as the world begins to see the true face of the Syrian rebels and their al-CIA backers, get ready for another Coney 2012 style public relations stunt to characterize the rebels as angelic democratic freedom fighters when of course as we know they're nothing of the sort and sticking with Syria now new spin attack Syria to fight Al Qaeda this is also infowars.com we are now clearly entering a new phase in the propaganda war with regard to Syria heralded by the NATO aligned establishment now using the presence of Al Qaeda fighters in the country many of whom were airlifted into Syria by NATO powers as a justification to launch a wider military assault. And this story concerns a RAND Corporation report which was published recently, also appeared in the Wall Street Journal, and it actually cites the presence of Al Qaeda fighters in Syria as a justification for US military intervention. Of course, the thing that it doesn't mention is the fact that those same Al Qaeda members who helped NATO overthrow Gaddafi in Libya were airlifted from Libya into Syria by NATO powers. And in fact, now there's even more documentation about how all these Libyan mercenaries are coming into Aleppo to help the so called Syrian rebels in that fight. So, this is all documented that NATO powers, under the guise of the puppet transitional Libyan government, got all these fighters that helped them kill and overthrow Gaddafi, transport them into Syria. And of course, they were all under the banner of the LIFG and its offshoots, which is Al-Qaeda. They were the second biggest contingent in Iraq killing US troops. So now they're saying they've gone beyond denying that Al-Qaeda's, you know, merely running the rebels in Syria. They're openly admitting it, but now using their presence as a reason for intervention, even though they put them there in the first place. And this RAN report goes on to claim that, you know, the peaceful democratic rebels, the grassroots rebels in Syria, denounce the Al-Qaeda presence among them, and they want nothing to do with them. But then you read a Guardian article, which has been doing the rounds big style in the past couple of days, because it's, it's quite a glowing report about how Al-Qaeda is now running the insurgency in Syria. You know, remember, Al-Qaeda are now the good guys. Oceania was never at war with Eurasia. Al-Qaeda terrorism in Syria is good terrorism. Anywhere else, it's bad terrorism. If it's in Syria, it's good. So now the Guardian admits that far from the FSA and Al-Qaeda being opposite forces, far from Al-Qaeda merely hijacking the trouble, Al-Qaeda is directing the FSA rebels. Here's a quote from an Al-Qaeda fighter in Syria. Quote, we have clear instructions from our Al-Qaeda leadership that if the FSA need our help, we should give it. We help them with IEDs and car bombs. These are the democratic freedom fighters. Our main talent is in the bombing operations, said former FSA rebel turned Al-Qaeda commander Abu Kuda, adding that Al-Qaeda fighters meet, quote, every day with Syrian rebels. So they meet with Syrian rebels every day, teach them how to make bombs, then you see the attacks on government buildings, the assassinations of political leaders in Syria. But no, Syria and Al-Qaeda, they're not working together because they need to prolong that myth to use the presence of Al-Qaeda in Syria as a reason to invade. So while they're denying it, <laughs> the very FSA rebel turned Al-Qaeda commander in Syria admits they meet every day and they make bombs with each other. So... I mean, add to it, you know, Ambassador Susan Rice, remember her quote after one of the attacks on the government building in Damascus. She threatened Assad with more terror attacks in, unless he stepped down. And then a couple of weeks ago, when the top Syrian officials were assassinated, 
um, the White House came out and lauded the fact that they were assassinated. They didn't say this is an act of terrorism, we shouldn't commend it. They lauded the fact. So Al-Qaeda carrying out bombings applauded by the White House, Al-Qaeda teaching Syrian rebels how to make bombs, IEDs, but we need to invade Syria because of Al-Qaeda. Doesn't seem to make sense, does it? It's like, you know, they gave Saddam the WMDs, which he used, and then said, oh, by the way, we need to invade Iraq because Saddam's got WMDs. Of course, the only difference is that unlike WMDs in Iraq, there really are Al-Qaeda fighters in Syria, and they're running the show. They're training the rebels how to make bombs. But the rebels are great. Al-Qaeda's still bad. Uh, unless they carry out bombings, then, then they're good, because it helps NATO. But we need to invade Syria because of Al-Qaeda. There you go. That's the level of the propaganda that we've reached now. And talking of more propaganda in regard to Syria, this is a report by Aaron Dykes. Busted Photoshop forgery to sell image of war-torn Syria exposed while mainstream press have been hailing the alliance between Al-Qaeda, the Syrian Free Army and the West in opposing Assad in Syria. They've also been caught once again faking the war to play up sympathy for an all-out invasion. Austria's largest daily newspaper, Kronen Zeitung, with some three million readers daily, published this sympathetic photo seemingly portraying a man carrying a baby and a woman in a burqa fleeing from some war-torn corner of Syria. However, it was later exposed to be a Photoshop forgery, juxtaposing the people walking on a normal-looking corner with that of a blown-out city block ravaged with heavy damage. And you can see in this photo, which is in this article, it's just a normal scene of a man carrying a baby down a quiet street, and they photoshopped it onto this background of blown-out apartment blocks. And as Aaron points out in this article, the idea is lifted almost directly from the 1997 movie Wag the Dog, which of course starred Dustin Hoffman, Robert De Niro, which satirized how to use the media and Hollywood to create a fake war through manipulation of imagery. And in fact, in that film, they used a scene of a woman carrying a kitten with a blue screen behind her, then superimposed it onto a war zone. So almost pulling almost exactly the same tricks as featured in satirical films about faking wars from, you know, 15 years ago. That's the level we've reached now. And they're so desperate, you know, after the rise and the spectacular rise and fall of Syria Danny and all his propaganda, that they'll now try anything to sell this war. They've got the Coney 2012 PR scam, as we just discussed, and they continually fake more stories. There's another one which emerged. The BBC and The Guardian, this was back at the start of the month, heralded the defection of this supposed pro-Assad journalist in Syria called Hatan Slaver. They called it a great blow to the regime, when in fact, over the past couple of days, it's emerged that the journalist claimed he worked for a news organization in Syria that was pro-Assad. Turns out he never worked for them at all. He applied for the job and was turned away. Yet the BBC and The Guardian jumped on it and said, oh my God, look at this. We've got journalists, even journalists defecting in Syria now. All turned out to be complete crap. Never happened, never worked for the organization. But, you know, there's no retraction. They just move on to the next piece of propaganda. Shifting to world news. Iranian Ayatollah, war within weeks. Iran's supreme leader, Ayatollah Ali Khamenei, told top Iranian military chiefs to expect war within weeks at a recent war council meeting, according to Israeli news outlet Debka File. On July 27, just before Friday's prayers, Iran's supreme leader, Alatollah Ali Khamenei, summoned top Iranian military chiefs for what he called, quote, the last war council. Quote, we'll be at war within weeks, he told the gathering. Debka File's exclusive Iranian sources disclosed. So, of course, we had the fairly substantive reports from a few months back about how the attack on Iran's nuclear facilities had been delayed till spring 2013. But in more recent weeks, we've had this kind of parallel narrative that Obama and Israel are gearing up for an assault on Iran's nuclear facilities in October, which could act, of course, as the October surprise. So, I mean, we've got two narratives. Who knows? I mean, it is Debka file. Sometimes they're stunningly accurate. You know, they predicted the precise time in which the overthrow of Gaddafi would take place. They got that right. Sometimes 
So just make stuff up. Sometimes it's just Mossad propaganda, so it can go either way. What we do know for a fact is that the plan to close the Strait of Hormuz, through which you know 33% of the world's oil passes, has been finalized by Iran. They came out last week and said it's done, it's ready, we can close it down on a whim. Of course, you've got the underwater mine ships that the US has dispatched to the region. You've got the USS Enterprise and Eisenhower aircraft carriers never far away. So the tension continues to build, but more speculation, we hear it almost every year, about an attack on Iran, possibly coming up in October, if not spring next year. But, you know, from these reports, Iran is prepared, and they're prepared for war within weeks in the time frame of September or October. Switching to domestic news now, ABC to run drama demonizing militias. In keeping with the federal government's ongoing effort to cast state militias in a sinister light, ABC has given the go-ahead to Hollywood darlings Lorenzo D. Bonaventura and Dan McDermott to produce a drama demonizing a fictional Texas militia. The network has bought drama pitch Founding Fathers from D. Bonaventura Pictures and ABC Studios. Written by feature scribe Rich Dovidio, Founding Fathers is described as Donny Brasco set in the world of Texas militias. Neil Andreeva writes for Deadline Hollywood. It centers on Nick Keating, who after serving a third tour in Afghanistan, returns home to find his small Texas town under the control of a militia group led by his older foster brother. After being seduced by the militia's surprisingly community-based motives, he accepts a rare invitation to join the group. But unbeknownst to his new family, Nick has a secret agenda that will put his life in jeopardy and lead him to question his allegiances. So again, the symbiotic relationship between television producers and the federal government continues apace. Of course, this ties in perfectly to the agenda to demonize politically active libertarians and conservatives as domestic extremists, as you've seen in the Mayak report, the DHS report, uh, the DHS-funded National Terrorism Report, which listed conservatives, libertarians as extremists, while, of course, completely omitting the fact that the terrorism carried out in the United States has been blamed mostly on Muslims. They were not mentioned at all in these recent reports. So we're back again to demonizing the deadly militias. Of course, we had the Hutari militia, who, of course, were arrested in a blaze of publicity uh, supposedly planning to wage war against the U.S. government, according to the uh, bellicose media reports at the time. And, of course, what happened? Well, they were all released without charge. But, you know, you didn't hear about that quite as much, did you, when they were all released without charge and the whole story collapsed, as it routinely does with every act of terrorism inside the United States, most of which, of course, as the New York Times now admits, are provocateur by the FBI. But these TV drama shows basically exist to just demonize liberty-minded people. I mean, you've seen CSI breaking every law in the Constitution to solve the crime and catch the bad guy. You know, we've had Ron Paul supporters characterized as drug-dealing terrorists, innumerable other examples of this. And it's just more of the same. It's more of the same DHS agenda. You know, they put out the PSA videos where every terrorist is a white, middle-class American. It's all heading in that direction. It's the war against middle-class America. And we're going to be doing a big report on this for our magazine that we've got coming out soon. So look out for that. The DHS, in association with TV producers, continues its war against politically active conservative and libertarian Americans. Death from above. Navy drone logo features Grim Reaper. The US Navy, which has just revealed the latest development in stealth drone technology, is using a logo for its unmanned aviation program that literally features the angel of death clothed in a black cloak with a hood holding aloft a large scythe. Oh, this is the freedom that we're raining down with the drones, the angel of death. The logo for the Navy's program, Executive Office for Unmanned Aviation Strike Weapons, was photographed and posted to Instagram by Wired's writer Spencer Ackerman. And so remember, as we talked about earlier, while the US supports al-Qaeda terrorists in Libya and Syria, applauds their bombings in Damascus, Ambassador Susan Rice, 
they're celebrating the fact that, you know, they're going after the real bad guys by painting up these drones with an image of the Grim Reaper with red glowing eyes and a big scythe above, above his head. Because they can be confident that they're going after the real bad guys with these drones, you know, like little kids in Pakistan and wedding parties in Afghanistan and things like that. Because that's, who, that's who's being killed by these drones. And I actually picked out this um, U.S. Army Chan in Iraq, which was revealed by Josh Stiber, who was a conscientious objector uh, upon his return from Iraq. He actually fought in Iraq. And this is what U.S. troops in Iraq sing, bearing in mind they're now painting drones with the Grim Reaper image. This is what they sing in Iraq. I went down to the market where all the women shop. I pulled out my machete and I began to chop. I went down to the park where all the children play I pulled out my machine gun and I began to spray. That's Operation Liberation Freedom in Iraq. That's what US troops chant in Iraq, according to Josh Stiber, who served in Iraq. And there's another out of the LA Times. This was from 1989. This is what they chant at Camp Pendleton. One, two, three, four. Every night we pray for war. Five, six, seven, eight. Rape, kill, Mutilate. That's what US troops chant at Camp Pendleton, report of the LA Times. So, I mean, <laughs> this is why America has lost its legitimacy. Do you think the soldiers that fought at Iwo Jima in World War II, you know, joked and chanted about chopping up little Japanese kids? I don't think they did. Because they were fighting, at least what they thought they were fighting for was something good. They were fighting against the Nazis and their Axis allies. They had some level of dignity. Now we've got troops in Iraq chanting about how they like to chop women up and spray kids with machine guns. We've got troops at Camp Pendleton chanting about how they want to rape, kill and mutilate people. So is it really any surprise that the drones that rain down even more death are now being painted with an image of the Grim Reaper? That's what it's all about. Hardly about spreading democracy, is it? Now, moving on. Is this the most truthful four-minute newscast about the Federal Reserve ever? Let's go to the clip. The Federal Reserve Act of 1913 wasn't drafted by Congress. It was drafted under great secrecy in a meeting of associates of very powerful men. The Fed was drafted with five objectives. Number one, to stop competition from newer banks. Two, to obtain a franchise to create money out of nothing for the purpose of lending. Three, to get control of all the reserves of other banks so that reckless banks wouldn't be overrun. Four, to shift the losses from the banks to the taxpayers. And five, to convince Congress that the purpose was to protect the public. And you remember we played a clip from the same news anchor last week where he was talking about the Batman massacre there in uh, Colorado and all the anomalies with that, you know, the reports of two shooters and everything else that goes with it, the um, proficiency that James Holmes had in rigging his apartment with explosives even though he knew nothing about the subject. So you basically, you've got to say kudos to uh, Ben Swan, and I think this is Fox 19 out of Cincinnati, for having the balls to air some actual truth on mainstream news network television. Um, because when it happens, it's happened elsewhere, and usually the people do it are off the air within weeks. Remember the, um, the Young Turks guy from MSNBC? He started talking about just a little bit of truth, Within weeks, he got a, he was hauled into a meeting by MSNBC bosses and told, the people in Washington don't like what you're saying. You've got to stop this. You've got to stop telling the truth. And uh, much to his credit, he refused, and he was yanked off the air within weeks, even though his, his program was one of the most popular shows on, on MSNBC. So either, you know, these guys are having to adapt or die, I guess. That's the point I made last time, because they don't want to end up like CNN, you know, completely pathetic with no viewers, sank another 20% again just in the past few days, according to the latest figures. So they're being forced to tell at least some of the truth. So Ben Swan and his reality check are at least serving that function on mainstream news network television. Um, so it's kudos to him, and we hope that this segment uh, continues to throw up 
uh, some of these intriguing stories and at least inject a little bit of truth into the mainstream news network paradigm. Now, of course, Ted Cruz recently defeated David Dewhurst. Uh, much of his support was surrounding the fact that he was central in the fight against the TSA. And uh, Richard Reeves, our reporter, interviewed Ted Cruz a while back, so we're going to go to that interview now. There is a bill for impeachment of Barack Obama right now, started by uh, Walter Jones of North Carolina. My well, view is we've got to focus on how we actually move the ball forward. As long as the Democrats control the Senate, impeachment won't happen. Harry Reid is killing everything in the Senate. So we've got to focus on what we can actually get done, and what we can get done is we can vote him out in November and we can bring in strong conservative leaders because we need to not just stop this explosion of government power and spending, we need to turn it back and roll it back. And that's what I intend to lead the fight to do. I'll give you an example of something that I think is an outright disgrace, and that's the Fast and Furious program. The Fast and Furious program, we had our federal government, the U.S. Department of Justice, knowingly, willingly, deliberately selling guns to Mexican drug cartels. And those guns were used to murder innocent civilians and at least one federal law enforcement officer. Now, I had been calling for months, initially for an investigation of Eric Holder, then for Eric Holder to be hired, fired, and I believe the House should impeach Eric Holder right now. And, and that we need to stand and fight, but we need to have a president who respects the Constitution. If you have a president that will trample on the Constitution, liberty will inevitably be the victim. Quote of the day on InfoWars Nightly News comes from Brent Scowcroft, quoted in the Washington Post, May 1991. Quote, we believe we are creating the beginning of a new world order coming out of the collapse of the U.S.-Soviet antagonisms. And isn't that ironic, given the fact that the drone program, which is now being used to spy on American citizens, was perfected over the last six years in Russia. Uh, they openly admit that their drone program is to be used to spy on street protests. And of course, the recent cybersecurity legislation in the United States is also modeled on Russia. So that new world order coming out of those uh, post-Soviet antagonisms uh, certainly uh, has its influence in Soviet-style command and control policies. So that's very apt. Uh, Brent Scowcroft, 1991 Washington Post quote. We're going to go to a break now, but coming up, Rob Dew interviews Dave Krieger from cloudedtitles.com. Stay tuned. Alex Jones here with a message to fellow freedom lovers. The prognosis for the entire planetary economic system runs from bad to worse. The globalist model is to shut down societies and starve patriots out until they acquiesce to the global takeover. That's why we've assembled the most vital and important preparedness items at InfoWarsShop.com. These are items that I did research on, that I personally use. We've got the life straw, so you can turn fetid water into safe water anywhere you go. The KTOR hand crank generator to charge up key equipment during power outages or out in the field. Strategic relocation, third edition by Joel Skousen. When disaster strikes by Matthew Stein. Therosafe, used by Homeland Security to protect yourself during any radiological event. Hand crank shortwave AM FM radios. Everything that we've researched and found to be the best is available at InfoWarsShop.com and your purchase makes our InfoWar possible. We're getting prepared. Are you? InfoWarsShop.com Sick of the globalist eugenicist control freaks adding poison to your water and laughing as you get sick and die? Start purifying your water with ProPure. My friends, I've done a lot of research, and the best gravity filter out there, bar none, is ProPure. And it's available discounted at InfoWars.com. Its filters are silver impregnated to prevent bacterial growth. There's no priming required. It's NSF 42 certified. Optional fluoride filters can reduce fluoride up to 95%. Easy to set up and use. Does 
doesn't require electricity. Purify water from lakes, streams, ponds, and wells. This filter system leaves in beneficial minerals, which is key. Save money by not buying bottled water and avoid BPA that leaches from the plastic. ProPure is the best gravity-fed filter out there. It's what my family uses. Infowars.com already has the lowest price on ProPure. But if you add the promo code WATER at checkout, you get an additional 10% off at Infowars.com. You can also call to order 888-253-3139. Welcome back to InfoWars Nightly News. I'm your host, Rob Dew. Big thanks to Paul Joseph Watson for taking over news duties tonight. Tomorrow, Alex will be on the show with Larry Pickney. He's the former Black Panther head who's been harassed by the government for actually being somebody who's out there doing positive things for humanity rather than sucking off of it like a parasite. Can't have that. Another group, we're, we're going to talk a lot more about parasites today here. I've got uh, Dave Krieger sitting next to me. He's written the book Clouded Titles, which we carry at Infowars.com. We have it on sale. It retails for $49.95. We have it on sale, $10 off, $39.95. There it is right there. You can go to Infowarsshop.com or just go to Infowars.com and click on the shop link at the top to check that out. And why do we have Dave on? We just had him on last week, and this is a big deal. Uh, there's over 1.4 million homes in foreclosure right now. And there's a foreclosure map. That's just in 2008. That's when everything just started heating up. Uh, take a look at Michigan and Wisconsin, and then you have California, Arizona. Now, this is today as of March 2012. A lot more homes going in foreclosure than were back in 2008 when we had the financial crisis. So we turn now to Dave Krieger and welcome him to the show. Dave, how's it going? Welcome, Rob. Thank you. Right. Thank, thanks Good for coming on. Again. Yeah, yeah. It's great to have you on. This is a, a big subject that a lot of people have been talking about. You were telling me earlier somebody contacted you from Australia. After As a matter of fact, show. You, your show has huge reach and I was uh, totally blown away when I opened it up and I was getting questions about what's going on and she says, well, I understand securitization. Mm -hmm. uh, could you explain a little more? Does, does the chain of title work the same way in the states as it does, you know, in Australia as it does here. I said, you know, in, in theory, there's a lot of things in the book that make sense. But as far as, you know, equating this with the Commonwealth, this book was basically written for U.S. citizens right. or residents or whatever you want to call the little 14th Amendment. Our foreclosures go counterclockwise down the yeah. drain. Theirs go Exactly the other way. Yeah. You know, it depends on if, if uh, you know, where the shark is on the Great Barrier Reef. But right. uh, you know, they basically, uh, they do have securitization over there, mm -hmm. and they do have, uh, you know, any time that there's a securitized note involved, there's a pooling and servicing agreement. And I talk about this heavily in the book. This is a real deep subject to get into, uh, you know, on the surface without, you know, holding a seminar, which right. we'll talk about. Sure. Uh, we're actually doing a chain of title assessment workshop in Chicago on August 18th and 19th. And uh, what we do is we actually teach people how to do chain of title assessments. This is kind of a fundamental thing for anybody like yourself, for example, mm -hmm. who's gone out and bought real estate. Right. And so you, the biggest phobia, and I actually got some people that were uh, watching the video that mm -hmm. uh, Alex and I did the other day, and they're emailing me asking me, you know, well, I'm getting ready to close on a piece of property. What should I do? Yeah, that's a big question because um, I've, I've closed on two pieces of property. It is a crazy process. They take you in a room and they just throw paper at you to sign. And you really don't have time to read it. I read the first two documents, and I could, I could just feel them tapping their foot. I was like, J just hurry up and just go through the process. You need to sign these documents so we can pay the 15 people who are, who are in the feeding line. Oh, how, it, about, you, how about the one that's, uh, well, I have a closing in 15 minutes. I got another closing, so we oh, have to exactly. hurry up. Yeah, yeah. You know, they think, well, you just want the keys anyway, so here, just sign these documents and sign your life away. Right. And you have no idea what you're signing. And a majority of the people that, that actually buy this book um, and, and it was written for them. I have a lot of people that actually write me and they, they call this their Bible. Yeah. Uh, and literally, I, I have people that have tabbed it and highlighted it and, and taken it into different sections so they can you know, try to get their hand around and understand exactly what's going on mm -hmm. because this is a massive subject. And you know, when you're talking about foreclosures or deeds or chain of title, um, and it, it depends on who I'm talking to. The conversation shifts in 15 different directions depending on the need because everybody's got different needs. Right. And most of the homeowners that are involved in this were sucker punched in 2003 when this whole fracas first started. Right. Uh, what ended up happening was that they uh, were told, well, you know, home ownership is where it's at in America. America is prosperous. America is great. Everybody needs to own a home. So here's what we want you to do. We're, we, the banks all of a sudden opened up the floodgates and made credit just available. 
They have first-time homebuyer programs, oh, all, everything. All There's all the kinds of programs. And program, there's yeah. the key word. <laughs> you know, what was going on behind the scenes, Rob, is they were taking, and they had all these securities set up on Wall Street in trusts. We mm -hmm. call them SPVs for special purpose vehicle or SIV for special investment vehicle. Okay. And so what happens is, is they have all these notes in the pool and they're all there assigned and all the borrower has to do is go to closing and put their name on that deed of trust or mortgage. Wow. All of a sudden, the, you'll notice because MERS is involved and mm -hmm. we'll talk about that, MERS, M-E-R-S, yeah. is an acronym for Mortgage Electronic Registration Systems. This is a, a database, in essence, that was started because people say, well, where'd this MERS come from? MERS started from Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac, the Mortgage Bankers Association, the American Land Title Association, and all the major banks, they all jumped in. Mm -hmm. MERS has now over 5,500 members. And, and who are the members in MERS? All the major banks and the servicers. There's okay. like 3,300 servicers, mm -hmm. which are the people that are actually taking the mortgage payments for your loan. Okay. So people starting out with Clouded Titles 101 first need to understand that what the mortgage bankers did was they set MERS up to do nothing but track the transfers on Wall Street okay. between all the sales that were going on. Mm -hmm. If you look on your deed of trust, and I mean, I, I tell people to do this, get out your, your, your specs, put them on, and look at your files. Get out the deed, get out the mortgage, look at what you got, look and see whether you see that little MIN number, that M-I-N, MERS identification number, see if you have that MIN number on your document, because it'll be right there next to the document title, where it mm -hmm. says mortgage or deed of trust on page one, it'll be there. That's like the social security number for the, of, for the of securitization, deed. because okay. the intent was to securitize the loan. Right. Right out of the gate. Now, they never told the borrowers this. No, no. You, they're they're going to go out and make money on your mortgage. Exactly. And there's so many theories floating around right now. There, there's a theory where the um, what happened was is the lenders went in and they borrowed the money from the Fed mm -hmm. at a cheap interest rate. Of course, yeah. And so they, they, they have this money and what they needed is the borrower's signature. To release the money. To release the money. Yeah. So the borrower signs, gives up their personal identifying information, their social, where they live, their job history, everything, right. whether it's fabricated or not, because we know that in 2003 through 2008, there were ninja loans, mm -hmm. which is no income, no job, no assets. There were liar loans that basically stated income. Just sure. put down whatever. Well, let's tell you what. We'll make something up and we'll dummy up your financials sure. to make it look like you right. can afford this half a million dollar house. When in effect, you should have had a house that cost $50,000, not a half million. Right. You could only legally afford to pay this much. Well, back, back in those days, it appears unconscionable that they would do stuff like this. And so they, they basically sucker punched people at the closing table mm -hmm. and they had them sign these documents. And here's this money that's coming out of the Fed out of the treasury and so what's happening now is the investors that are coming in through wall street and they're looking at these 424b5 prospectuses now these prospectuses have all these documents inside of them like the pooling and servicing agreement which shows you all the terms and conditions for the trust right so people they have no idea this is going on behind the scenes they have no idea that their own 401ks that they've been putting money into on their job right they're being, are being used that, yeah. and pledged into these trusts which have loans in them that are structured to fail. Of course. And so they're playing both ends of the coin with the banks as the middleman. And so once that investor money comes in, what does the bank do with it? Pays off the note. Mm -hmm. So the note is paid in full. The note you signed is paid in full. That's one of the theories that's floating around right now that attorneys are trying to get discovery on. And then they take the money you send in and use that as, as leverage to buy Exactly. Whatever. And a lot of it gets shaved off in what we call a yield spread premium. Mm -hmm. And so that's something that's totally different than most investors understand and most brokerages understand. But, you know, long and short is, is they have an aggregate fund manager that has all this money coming in from all these investment pools. And so all that money gets spent. Now, when you are an investor and you're expecting getting a return, and we start looking at these documents in the chain of title where an assignment has been recorded, and when they record the assignment, it's dated years past the date the pooling and servicing agreement says it should be put in the pool. Mm -hmm. So if there's a cutoff date on the trust of September 30th, 2007, and the document, the assignment isn't recorded until 2012, well, they just missed the trust pool by five years, wow. and it violates New York trust law. Mm -hmm. And a lot of the banks, they want to come into court. They don't want that PSA getting introduced as evidence right. because then the real truth will come out. 
Yeah. And see, judges are, are now starting to figure this out. They're starting to understand because MERS's own CEO, as we commented on Alex's uh, program mm -hmm. uh, last week, uh, we, we commented the fact that, you know, when you split the deed from the note, the note's a nullity, according to Carpenter versus Longin, which is an 1872 Supreme Court case out of Colorado. You, you have to keep the note and the mortgage together. They just ruled on this in the Eaton versus Fannie Mae case in Massachusetts. Mm -hmm. This just came out in the course and now wasn't made retroactive because that would have unleashed a firestorm of lawsuits. So what MERS has done basically, according to the accusations that the attorneys are making in court, is they've obfuscated the chain of title. When it goes into the MERS system, you have no idea who owns the note. It gets sold and resold and resold. And if you look at your mortgage or deed of trust in, in the long form, which is like a form 3043, 3044, 3048, mm -hmm. they're Fannie Freddie uniform instruments with MERS. And if you look at paragraph 19 or 20, clause 19 or 20, under sale of note, change of servicer, this is what gives them the license to take your note, split it off from the deed, and run with it. And so they're out there on Wall Street selling this note. It's been paid over wow. and over and over again. And because it's tracked on the MERS electronic database and never recorded in the land records, you have no idea, not only who doesn't, you, know, you have no idea who owns the note, but also the assignments are never recorded. There's and no so, chain of custody going. Uh, there you go. Yeah. And see, when you're looking at the chain of custody of the note versus the chain of title, they're in two totally opposite directions. Hmm. You have no idea, and this is why we do chain of title assessments, because that's one half of the equation. Right. And so we're training people to do what I do. I have attorneys calling me from all over the country, Rob, and they're asking me, look, would you look at this person's title from the warranty deed forward and tell me what's wrong with it? And I've actually, attorneys have literally just missed these things. This is what I train people to do, is right. to you know, put on the eagle eye and spot the problems. And now, it, going going to your seminar or getting the book, is this for people who, who are are thinking about buying property, or have already bought property, or you know, is it if they're already getting foreclosed on, is it too late for them to start learning these things? To, to actually, I have a lot of people coming to this upcoming Coda seminar in Chicago, mm -hmm. the workshop, and a lot of them are being foreclosed on. I had a woman in Las Vegas today, and she's coming, and she told me I've lost millions of dollars in real estate. I own a lot of rental properties. Mm. And she says, I want to learn what's going on here because I have a sneaking suspicion that I've got, you know, a, a pretty good case on a lot of this stuff. And I said, well, you might. I said, the, the saving grace about Nevada is they just passed Assembly Bill 284. Mm -hmm. Lenders can't just come into court willy-nilly and file all these documents. They have to attest to the validity of the document, and if they don't, it's criminal. Right. And they can actually get jail time and get disbarred. So this was a huge thing in Nevada, which, by the way, when you looked at that 2012 foreclosure map that you were showing on there, you see what we call the sand states. Right. This is where the biggest hit was taken. If you notice, in 2008, which is what you're looking at right now, you'll notice that Southern California and Nevada, especially up in Vegas, Reno, uh, all up, you know, and when you go through the, uh, like Florida, mm -hmm. Florida, Arizona, Nevada, and California are what we call the sand states. Right. You'll notice how much pink is in there and how it was hit in 2008. Well, as the jobs started to diminish. Right. If you go to the 2012 map, look at this. Now you look at the Rust Belt up there in Michigan yeah. and Iowa and all those places in there, you notice how all of a sudden there's big clusters of foreclosures going on. We're looking at another 4 million foreclosures in 2012 and it just keeps growing and growing and growing. It's an epidemic and a lot of this is people were duped into these, they were given, and now we've learned that the interest rate that everything's based off of is false as well with the LIBOR scandal. Exactly. So it's just scandal after scandal after scandal. Let's get into robo signing because because that's another part of this where there you have people signing these titles who aren't licensed to sign them but they're just signing them for somebody because there's a glut of these things that need to be signed is that am I am I getting that right or basically the term robo signing was coined by you know there was a, a handful of attorneys that started doing depositions mm -hmm. of these people that were assigning documents and when they looked at the assignments they basically said well you know what's wrong with this picture because here we have an assignment from this person Linda Green and she's signing this document as vice president for Wells Fargo. Right. But then we turn around and we have the same address and same zip code and same people preparing the documents. And here's Linda Green signing again, only this time she's signing as vice president of Chase. Yeah. And so it's <laughs> like, well, wait a minute. The two Linda Green signatures are markedly different. Yeah. And so this is another term, what we call surrogate signing. This is where they have, and they actually did admit to this, they have signing rooms in places like the now defunct DOCX or DOCS, D-O-C-X. Okay. 
And if you happen to be going through your assignments in the land records, ladies and gentlemen, and you happen to see the name Ronald Maharg on the top of your paper in the upper left-hand corner, and you look down and you see DOCX or DOCX, all of a sudden, red flags should go up because the people that are doing this, these people were document manufacturers. And what, they, what we're finding out that they did, it appears that they have one room full of people. All they did was sign their names to documents, 350 of them an hour. God. <laughs> and they're paid ten dollars an hour to sign right. as vice president of some bank, mm -hmm. and we don't even know. You know, when you ask them in deposition, uh, you know, where is the authority that you have to sign these things? Do you have a power of attorney or some mm -hmm. signing authority that's been given you, you know, power to sign your name as vice president of these? And a lot of them are signing them as vice president or assistant secretary for MERS. Wow. And what they're doing is they're conveying the note, and a lot of these cases are saying that MERS doesn't have the authority to convey the note because MERS doesn't have an interest in the note. You can only grant what you have an interest in. And according to the contracts you signed at closing, mm -hmm. which was your deed of trust or mortgage, you only gave MERS the power to be the beneficiary on paper. And what that does is it creates a static condition in the land records, according to the way that we are looking at their business model. And it appears that this static condition basically will suffice for all the transactions that are conducted outside the recorded system that we okay. know it. Right. You know, this system started back in like 1600s, yeah. 1638 in, in Plymouth, you know, in the Massachusetts Bay Colony. I mean, this thing is as old as this country. And, you know, we've relied on this, and, and the judges are even starting to turn an eye to this stuff and say, you know, there's something really weird going on here, uh, and, and if you don't give me the entire chain of title, I don't know exactly how you got it, Mr. Lender. And so this is where we're having, you know, big issues in court. Mm -hmm. uh, the, there's just the, the robo-signing thing is literally touched off a firestorm of depositions. And we have robo-signers here in Austin, Texas that are being called on the carpet. One signs as a, as a signer, as vice president of One West Bank, but then they were, of course, you know, taken over by Mac Bank, mm -hmm. and the FDIC was the receiver. And, and before, we have the same person signing as a vice president of Mac Bank, yeah. and, it's, and it's like, and then she admitted in deposition, she never even read the document. She never even knew what she was signing. And then we asked, you know, the, the attorney asked her, and, and where is the notary that supposedly witnessed this document? Well, the notary is in another part of the building. So mm -hmm. when we go into depositions, when we consult attorneys, we ask them to get a copy of the, the floor plan of the building that the person signing these documents oh, wow. sits in. Yeah. Because then we can say, okay, now where does the notary sit in relation to you? Because Texas law clearly says the notary must be present when you sign the document and you must sign their logbook. They are required to keep a journal. Okay. So when, yeah. when we go into deposition, we say, okay, where's your journal? You know, the attorney would literally say, I need to see the journal. You know, show me where in your journal it says that you witnessed this. And defense says there's no journal. There's nothing there. And they say, well, we don't, we're not required to keep a journal. Well, excuse me, no. Texas law says you are. I just went and got a, a document notarized at a bank, and they have a journal. And they, they sure put did. a stamp on it. And they and, made you sign it, oh, didn't yeah, they? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, that's, and that's the way it goes. It's, it's a proper paperwork procedure, as they say. Exactly. And so let's go into what this means for, uh, I guess, the housing industry in the future. What is going to happen with when the dust settles on all this? Are, are people going to... If, if you bought a house, say, can 10 years later, somebody come back and say, hey, that wasn't done right. That's still my house. Is that, is that going to be happening in the it, future? It is happening. Oh, my God. And not only is it, is it happening in that regard, but it's also because of the MERS system, we are seeing a lot of cases where homeowners who thought they paid off their house are being subjected to double liability. Right. In other words, a lender <laughs> is coming out of the securitization system and saying, hey, uh, I had an interest in this, and as far as we know, we still have an interest in this property. And they're saying, but, but we paid it off yeah. six years ago. Well, we don't care. We're the servicer for this investor, and this investor says he owns it, so we're foreclosing. This has literally touched off a firestorm of lawsuits across the country. People buy short sales. Mm -hmm. Two months later, Chase Bank comes in, forecloses on this guy, cleans out his entire house, winterizes his toilets. He has to break in the basement window to discover all his heirlooms are gone. Everything's gone. He has a lawsuit against Chase. They break into some woman's house in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania while she's at work. Mm -hmm. They steal her pet parrot. Go figure. She has to drive two and a half hours to get her parrot back, but all her furniture is cleaned, cleaned out completely. They winterized the toilets. She is not in default on her mortgage. We have people that the banks have foreclosed on when the banks don't even own the loan. Right. It, it's that crazy because the left hand doesn't know what the right hand is doing. 
especially when you're dealing with a servicer and a trust entity and a bank. And everybody's getting different information, and it's coming through what we call a third-party document mill. And there are identified third parties that we talk about in the book, like lender processing services, like CoreLogic. They have mm -hmm. a document solutions in Chapin, South Carolina, on Boundary Street. We watch their stuff, you know, because we're, we're seeing documents come out of there that are generated by people, and they're using addresses we know are phony. And so we actually have talked to the mm. leasing agents at these addresses, and they say, no, MERS has never been here. And we have documentation. We know who to go depose. Right. The right. paralegals that I work with, uh, because we formed DK Consultants LLC for a reason, mm -hmm. and that was to actually assist counties in land record audits. And starting in October, we're actually auditing a county in Central Texas that literally is looking at the behavior of one specific attorney. Because they have him organized, all his signatures are organized by notary, mm -hmm. because all the notaries on this document, this stack of documents, look the same as far as the attorney's signature. But when you look at what this notary's doing, all the attorney signatures are different from this one. And when you go to the next stack, and there's six different notaries there, and they've got the same attorney's signature all the way down the line, and all the notary signatures compare with each notary that's signing these things, like the notary is surrogate signing his name, mm -hmm. and then stamping it. So you got to wonder whether God. the attorney is present at the time these things are being signed. Well, I think a grand jury would like to know that. Well, and you got to wonder how people could just do this openly and blatantly over and over again and not question it and not even whistleblow on it. How, how did this stuff start coming out? It, it, wasn't, it wasn't people whistleblowing. It was, as a matter of fact. There okay. were a lot of whistleblowers like Lynn Zimoniak, who's a fraud investigation attorney in, in, uh, in the uh, middle, of, middle of Florida near Jacksonville. Mm -hmm. And uh, she actually blew the whistle and was on CBS 60 Minutes. Oh, she's in Scott the 60 Minutes piece. And, was... and I was there with her when that aired. We had yeah. a big party, and there were a lot of homeowners there that were being foreclosed on that are right in the middle of foreclosure mm -hmm. issues and had hired attorneys. And we watched this, and it was hard to hear because everybody was screaming at the TV because they knew what was going on. They've had this happen in their own cases, and you just about cry yeah. looking at, at, the, at the sadness and, and the scope of this and how deep it goes and how much of, of an issue there is with the chain of title versus chain of custody of the note. And so, you know, the reason that I started doing these CLEs for attorneys in the seminars is to get people up to speed because, frankly, folks, I can't do this all by myself. So I'm willing to share the wealth and teach people how to make a good living. Right. And that's why we started the Coda Workshops. Excellent. Uh, you know, you, you mentioned that 60 Minutes thing. I found an article um, from recently. A Jupiter Farms family says they're robo-signing victims' house to be auctioned. And they watched uh, that, that 60 Minutes piece. They went around, did their own homework, found out they were part of this robo-signing thing. But it didn't matter. They still got uh, foreclosed on. They had to, their house got auctioned. So, like, if somebody's in this situation, what can they do if they, if they figure out, hey, I'm, I'm being robo-signed on, is, is it... I mean, how, how much, how wet do you have to get in order to, to get your house back? Well, it's, you seriously, and this is one of the things, you know, we, we talk about in the book under Section 3, mm -hmm. it's called Strategic Default. And in this particular section, I put it in here because I'm going to be honest with you, Rob, I walked away from a mortgage in 2003. Mm. I walked away from the house. Yeah. I packed it up. I called the bank. I says, here, it's yours. Take it. I can't sell it. I'm upside down. Right. They have new build jobs going on in the same subdivision that I'm in, and I can't sell my house because they can buy a brand new home cheaper than what I can sell my house for. Sure. So you know what? I've had it. I, n nuts to this. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and at that time, you know, my mortgage payments were only 900 a month wow. total between yeah. the first and the second. Mm -hmm. And they ended up selling the house and getting all their money out of it. Hmm. But, the, okay. uh, but the thing is, is that, you know, when you're, when you're looking at issues like this, a lot of people are doing this. They're looking at, at this book, and they're using it as a tool, and they call me and they go, well, should I stop paying my mortgage? And I'm like, look, I don't even know of an attorney that would answer that question <laughs> without getting himself in trouble. Right. I said, I can't tell you what to do. You know, that's why I wrote the book. I said, because if the book, if there's something in there for you, any little nugget that will help you make a decision, it's on your conscience. Right. So you basically have to decide whether or not you're going to fight or flight. If you're going to run, then restructure your life. Mm -hmm. This is what a lot of people have been doing. They've been staying in their houses, literally hiring an attorney to do nothing but stave off the wolves. Right. And so they'll stay in their house for a year and a half, two years, without making a mortgage payment. They'll pay the attorney a mere pittance of what their mortgage payment is. Sure. They will take all their money and accumulate it and then go somewhere else and buy for cash. Mm. Or they'll rent. Uh, you know, a lot of people that did, you know, we've talked about this before because I, I'm not totally, I, I understand the purpose of banks and why they're there, and not all banks are bad, 
I have to say that. You know, it's not a disclaimer, but I happen to know I'm work, I work with some good banks and banks that do care. I actually talked to a bank's attorney when I asked him, can you fix a chain of title that's been totally trashed by this, uh, this kind of a scenario? And he said, absolutely not. You cannot fix a chain of title other than to quiet it. And that's why we have what we call quiet title actions. Okay. And this is where you go into court and you basically put it out there to, uh, through publication and by direct service of the people you know and publication for the people you don't know. And you use the quiet title action to bring everybody into court. And a lot of attorneys are coupling this with a declaratory judgment action, which basically puts the burden of proof on them when they come into court. They have to actually prove that they own it. Right. I got the paperwork right here, Your Honor. That Which is what people weren't doing before. They were just not answering the mail exactly. or, or doing anything. And then it. that's de it's a default judggment. And then you, it doesn't matter if you were right or wrong. The exactly. judge is going to give it to the bank anyway. Exactly. Well, and see, if you don't fight and you don't get an attorney and, and get in the game, you know, the chances are, are not, you know, they diminish as far as your success rate. Right. I know a lot of people that have gone in pro se and have done pro se litigation. In fact, I just saw a ruling out of California today um, on, on a specific situation where the plaintiff homeowner actually won um, a, a judgment mm -hmm. and it was not a default judgment it was a summary judgment against Fannie Mae and they couldn't prove that they owned her paper and the judge literally quoted Carpenter versus Longin mm -hmm. that 1872's case that says when you split deed from note it's a nullity some judges understand this it's so simple but other judges, we have to actually look into their financial records and find out whether they own any bank loans. We had a judge in Palm Beach County, Florida, that had a massive Bank of America portfolio, and her, basically her retirement was in Bank of America. Right. And so here she's sitting on all these Bank of America cases. Go figure. Right. Well, and that, you know, after I'm looking at all this stuff today, Bank of America seems to be in the thick uh, of this mess. They seem to be, uh, my, my house loan, my current house loan, I didn't sign with Bank of America, but all of a sudden Bank of America sent me the bill. So they're they're out they're going out and reaching out and grabbing people's on there. I guess they're re, they're buying these mortgage securities that are out there and then they're becoming the mortgage holder at that point. Well, a lot but of how the, do they do? You know, that? We're still looking at, at how they acquired these mm -hmm. because if the if the trusts went bust, if they went into default and the investors lost their money, what they're doing is because of the fact that there is a 424B5 prospectus mm -hmm. that is issued and what this does is it contains all the information about the trust. Um, you know, I call it a poop sheet. And mm -hmm. basically, you look at it, it's got the PSA, the pooling and servicing agreement on there. It's got all the terms and the, and the distribution date. Tells you when the cutoff date is and when all the notes have to be in the pool. Has a closing date for when everything gets finalized. It has a distribution date, which is usually 30 days after the closing date, when the investors can expect to get a distribution of funds. Right. There are, uh, you know, anybody that's been playing in these things and realizes that they've been duped, if they're an investor, what they're doing now is they're coming back and they're suing the bank and they're saying, hey, you lied to us on the prospectus and we bought non-recourse bonds, which means they're powerless to come after the homeowner. They're mm -hmm. powerless to do anything. All they can do and what they've been doing, according to the research, is they've been going after the lenders and saying, hey, this... You know, the brokerage house is saying, this, this paper you sold us, this was fraud. This whole thing was fraud. You misrepresented, you lied to us on the prospectus. None of this stuff you're saying on this prospectus happened. And so what the banks are doing, who claim to be buying this portfolio, are giving the investors back their money at 10 cents on the dollar. Wow. And this is your 401k, folks, yeah. that went down the toilet. It's mm -hmm. gone. And this is why you see, when you look at that foreclosure map, you see all of these uh, shaded areas that are just, you know, I mean, you're looking at 4 million potential foreclosures this yeah. year. When you look at that map for 2012, I mean, this is huge. When, when you take that and you extrapolate it and you run that, that, uh, that map a little further into the year, you're going to notice it gets a whole lot darker. Well, and I think a lot of this, un, this great area is probably government land. Well, there, there most is, of that's government yeah. Montana. A well, lot of that's up government in that area, land. there there probably is a lot of government land. But the thing is, is that you know they control all this, and you know the the banks I think are waiting uh, and trying to stall off a lot of these cases. They don't want bad case law. What they're trying to do is trying to get themselves set up to where because they think the government will jump in and, and rescue them. Right, right. And say, well, and that's they have laws that they're trying to get written where retroactively they didn't do anything wrong. Exactly. At that point, there's we don't have to have chain of custody. We don't have to have the things that we've had in place exactly. since Plymouth Rock. All we have to do is say, well, it's okay now, we're going to wash our hands and move on. And this is a problem because the thing is, is that most states right now, this, this could come down to a, an issue between states' rights and mm -hmm. all the county clerks that are running the land records. 
when I first shared this information with the Texas Clerk School in January, mm -hmm. we had 200 clerks in, in, uh, come to attend this out of the 254 counties. The second session, which they were only 50 minutes long, but it was MERS 101, and I was explaining how this whole system came about and the robo-signing and everything. And when we first started out, I had 100 clerks in the second session, and I said, who here has heard of MERS? 100 clerks in the room. Three hands went up. Wow. Three hands. That's exactly the words that came Jeez. out of my mouth. Exactly <laughs> the words that came out of my mouth. I went, whoa. And then I said, how many have heard of robo-signing? One hand went up. Yeah. And I'm like, oh, kept you're in the dark and the mushrooms. In, yeah, you're in, in for a real treat, clerks. You're in for a real treat. Um, it, it, the problem was is that they don't understand the nature and scope of how deep this goes with chain of title. And one of the things that you know is now coming to light with a lot of these judges, a lot of them refuse to issue summary judgments and orders when the chain of title is not clear. Mm -hmm. And so homeowners literally, with their attorneys that have gone into court and said, we have an issue with chain of titles, it's put the brake on the, on the entire scenario, on the entire foreclosure. That's a good stall tactic. Well, my mantra something. is, if I can't convey, neither can they. Right. Oh, okay. That's my That's mantra. Good. It's always been my yeah. mantra. I put it in the book. If I can't sell this property, Your Honor, then the problem I have as a homeowner is, if, if it's uninsurable, mm -hmm. I can't sell it. Right. If a title company like... We had some inside information from one of the big title companies in Kansas City that one-third of the properties that were mortgaged or refinanced between 2003 and 2008 are uninsurable. That means that they can't get title insurance and they can't sell the house. Right. If they can't do it, how can the bank? How can the bank turn around and foreclose and sell that property? Well, banks are special. We have to give them money when they fail. You know, these yeah. are special creatures. These people need lots of money to live, all these bank executives. You know, and it's sad when, you know, the eight, one of the HSBC heads jumps off a building because he's probably involved in some fraud scandal funding Al-Qaeda. I mean, it, it's, it, it's amazing that we coddle to the banks over and over again instead of actually holding their feet to the fire. These are rules that they're supposed to be playing by. Well, They're exactly. supposed to be the professionals. And see, we have a lot of investors attending the Coda Workshop. And by the way, you know, this is the workbook that I give you at the workshop. It's yeah. 200 pages, and we actually have in here case studies. We actually go into detail, and we show you the difference. We show you the stamps. Here, the let's marker. get this. Here, we'll put this so, on the overhead cam so, right so here. You can, so you can see this. You'll you'll notice in here where we're we're looking at at specific issues, mm -hmm. and we actually show you how to read these these document stamps and and to how they are formulated by index. And so you know we we actually when we put this thing together, we show you in the workbook how this whole thing is set up, and we show you in here, uh, you know. What happens, and we, we ask you to look for certain things. We show you, you know, that it was countrywide loan. Mm -hmm. We actually take you through the entire structure. And if you look right here, um, you'll notice a document ID number. Ah, but what's this? Ah, there's your MIN number. There's our MERS yeah. identification number, our 18-digit number. Mm -hmm. You can actually go to the MERS website and take this number and input it into the website at MERS, mm -hmm. and you can actually find out who the servicer is, but only if you have your social security number. Now, imagine that. Hmm. How did MERS get your social security number? Well, when you agreed to make MERS the beneficiary, you gave MERS the permission to take your personal identifying information and run it all over Wall Street. Oh my goodness. Now who know that? Who knew yeah. who knew Nobody. that you were going to get shellacked like this and, and you know, frankly the borrowers were never told that their loans were going to be securitized and put out in Wall Street. It's like the banks are saying, Well, that's none of your business. What well you should do? get a percentage of that yeah. if they're using well, your money. You would think you, know? you would think that if the if the note was paid off in advance, that that paid off money would be applied to the borrower's mortgage. Sure. That's not the case. So we have we have the scenario, the theoretical scenario, that they're borrowing money from the Fed using investor money to pay off the Fed, so what the borrower signed and agreed to is paid in full. Mm -hmm. Then they're turning around and taking the investor money and investing it and, and pledging the same note over multiple pools, which if I did that and I pledged my house to several banks, I would be in jail. That's sure. a felony. Right. You know, but the banks did this. Banks they got away special. with it because they're yeah. unregulated. Yeah. And this is when they repealed Glass-Steagall mm -hmm. back in 1999 through, thank you, the Graham-Leach-Bliley Act. Uh, you know, if you want to mm -hmm. go in there, and, and I can tell you that Phil Graham right now, you know, if I was Phil Graham, I wouldn't be making any comments about, you know, what their intent was, because this is getting uglier by the minute, and homeowners are starting to rear their ugly head, and the more and more people that read this book and start talking to counsel and start researching their land records, mm -hmm. I actually, when we did the CLE in Austin in May, Rob, I had investors attending this workshop because they're studying these things before they go in and buy a house. They want to know what the chain of title looks like. And so they're studying condition of title.
Right. They don't want to make the same mistake because if they buy an REO or a short sale that that lender doesn't own and subject themselves to double liability, or in the case of one of the buyers, she paid cash, $60,000 cash for a house on acreage, and come to find out the lender didn't record their interest in the property till nine months after they gave her a special warranty deed. She didn't legally own the house. Wow. That's the take by the yeah. attorneys. And the attorneys are going, we can't quiet title. You don't own the property. You can only quiet title if you can prove you own it. So she, she has a whole different set of circumstances. This is how nuts this is getting, and that's why you know I'm encouraging people. I have a very limited number of seats in Chicago. Mm -hmm. Get in there and take this workshop and get the knowledge. Knowledge is power, and if you don't get it now, you know we don't know when we're going to do another one right. because we are so swamped with work. Right. I literally am training people to do what I do to share the money. Well, I mean, because a lot of people are broke. You right? know, you got potential four million people out there that could use this information. Well, or four million homeowners. Well, you, but you've got seventy million titles to property that have potential clouds on suspect issues on them. So you have seventy million potential problems. That you know, what do we have? A uh, hundred people, maybe, in the mm -hmm. United States that do chain of title, if that. Yeah. I mean, this is literally an, an open floor plan for anybody that is creative. And we actually teach you in the seminar how to market yourself and get yourself out there and how to network with attorneys and get in good graces and, and how to understand what constitutes unauthorized practice of law. Because the last thing we want right. is for the, the state's UPL committee to come after anyone because they said something they shouldn't have. Well, and, and you put that in the book. You put, you know, this is legal information. It's not legal advice. That's right. You can't. And, I can't give you legal advice. I'm just right. a paralegal and a, and a journalist. Right. But, you know, I've talked to enough attorneys and I put what they said in the book. Because yeah. what the attorney tells me is one thing. What I find in research is something totally different. And I basically leave it up to counsel. Uh, there is a forward in here by the former Ohio Attorney General, Mark Dan, who is in my network, and we talk mm -hmm. a lot. Uh, Mark Dan and I have spoken on stage together in front of crowds of homeowners, and I'll tell you what, they, that man is like a magnet. Uh, I got a phone call yesterday from Ty Johnson, who's mm -hmm. another attorney in Chicago. This guy's unbelievable. He studied at University of London in London you know, economics. Okay. Uh, the guy's incredible. Yeah. You know, when you look at attorneys like him and the attorney I work with in Dallas, Wade Cricken, all these people are putting themselves at risk because the banks don't like people that come out. Um, in fact, one foreclosure mill tried to hire the attorney I work with yeah, in right. Dallas. They tried to hire him away. Sure. And, and they'll, they'll literally, they will come to you and they will pay the attorney off. So he'll to never sit in a closet somewhere. So he'll never litigate yeah. against them again. Right. This is how they do this. They're not, they're not beyond this. Yeah, of course not. I mean, you know, they, they've... Most of the drug money is laundered is laundered by these major banks. I mean, it's been proven, and, and they pay small fines. They don't ever, you know, if I go rob a bank, I get put in jail. They they launder millions and millions uh, of dollars of drug money. They they pay a fraction of that in a in a fine. Billions, yeah, exactly. It's exactly. Billions. Well, remind me to send you the Credit Suisse indictment because right now they're working with the DOJ, and Credit Suisse was accused in this indictment of actually laundering money through the from the Iranian state banks into this country. They would literally change the bar and the transit codes and change the routing numbers to get that money in here. And this is basically what the indictment said. And uh, anybody wants a copy of that indictment, I'd be happy to share it with wow. them. Wow. Well, the, you know, I think we're going to end it there. That was a lot of information it to chew is. on. I really thank you for coming we in and explaining that. We haven't even scratched that. the tip of the iceberg. Exactly. You're, you're going to be on, uh, on the 10th for on two the 10th hours? On the 10th for two hours. Yeah, and we'll be yeah. taking phone calls, my understanding is. so. There you go. So that's going to be, what, August 10th? Two hours with Dave Krieger. Starting the, at noon. The yeah. book is Clouded Titles. And let me tell you, I've started reading it, and it's got, I, I've, I went uh, about 50 pages in, and then I started skimming around because I knew I was going to be interviewing Dave just to kind of get the, the juxtaposition of, of the book. And let me tell you, a lot of information here, a lot of practical information, and it's not, you know, there's a lot of weird acronyms going thrown out, but you explain them all, you keep people informed as it goes on. And let me tell you, for 40 bucks, you could really give yourself uh, hundreds of dollars worth of information, a great education. Uh, if, if you can get over in Chicago to his seminar, let's put that graphic up again. He's got a seminar coming up. What's the, what are the dates for that? Well, it's August 18th and 19th. It's a Saturday and Sunday. Okay. You can get into Chicago. It's at Country Inn and Suites. They have continental breakfast in the morning, so you can stay overnight. They've got decent room rates for, the, for us at the seminar. You just have to tell them you're attending the workshop. Eight to five. Eight to five, both is. days. And I'll tell you what, the last one that we did went way over. We were there till like 6.30 at night. Answering because, questions. Answering questions, yeah. because I will stay there as long as people need to get this information in their heads. Well, I, I know you'll, you'll hit overload after eight hours. That's why we have to sure. kind of keep this. But, you know, this is an opportunity right now that, that doesn't come very often. And so, you know, those of you who are out there that, that care, mm -hmm. that really care about about helping other people, this is a seminar you should go to. Well, you know, just talking to you for the last 
20, 30 minutes or so was overload for me. Just there's so much information here. And that's how it's been designed. The system has been designed to keep people stupid, to keep them dumbed down. And you put so many pieces of paper in front of, you know, the normal guy, and he just wants to get his house. He wants to get in. He wants to close. He wants to get the keys. And he's not sure what he's signing. And then well, that paper just goes out the door. And who knows where it goes? It's been securitized. It's used to fund wars. It's used to do all kinds of stuff that it shouldn't be doing. So... Hope you got the book. That's our show for today. If you're not a member of PrisonPlanet.tv, if you're watching this on YouTube, it costs a lot of money to put this together. It's, you know, we got to get guests in here. We got lights. We got employees. Uh, Rob Jacobs is out there. He's, he's a great editor and, and, uh, and great sound guy. You know, a lot of people out here putting stuff together. Join today, your 15-day free trial. We've got the movies. We've got special reports. We've got the nightly news, Alex Rance, plus the Daily Show. And don't forget, we also just launched a few months ago, planetinfowars.com. It's our new social network. And there's a little section right there, Ask Alex, where you can actually send your questions to Alex. And speaking of Ask Alex, we actually have, you thought it was over. We still got at least another 20 more minutes of InfoWars Nightly News. We got a 20-minute Ask Alex coming up right now. And then that's going to be the end of our show. I'm your host, Rob Dew. Thanks to Paul Joseph Watson for doing the news portion tonight. Thanks for Dave Krieger coming in and educating us a little bit on these clouded titles out there because that's information we do need to know. Uh, be sure you become a member of PrisonPlanet.tv if you're able to. We'd love to have you and join the family at PlanetInfoWars.com. See ya. Christy Hightower here from Planet InfoWars. I'm here with Alex Jones answering your questions from the Ask Alex group on planetinfowars.com. So go check out that group if you have questions for him. We're actually finishing the marathon version. So Yeah, I thought I could do 50 in one session. <laughs> yeah, it's now, it's now the third here. session. From now on, we'll just do 10 at a time. Yeah, we got to keep Let's it hit the last seven or eight here. All right, he's got a, he's got a haircut to go do. So. I look like a hippie. It's time to get this haircut. <laughs> We've already started taping this twice, and people call. or right. It doesn't matter. All right. Transmitting so worldwide. PlanetInfoWars.com. Absolutely. The first question, well, the, one of many actually. Dollar Bill Kill 1984. That's the username. He says, Alex, I know you're familiar with the JFK 11110, um, which he JFK enacted, which granted the Treasury the right to issue U.S. dollars backed by silver. Actually, where did that go? I had one. I know. I was going to say. Well, I was looking around in the studio. Somebody said yeah, you had one. No, I haven't. Uh, I haven't read these questions yet. That, but I guess you could have told me that one. No, I don't have. Uh... Who knows where it went? There was a rumor that we had we had one at one point. Yeah, we do. We but do. what I do have is a $100 trillion uh, Reserve Bank of Zimbabwe is where the Federal Reserve would like to take us. <laughs> Weimar Republic uh, and beyond level in, I like the in stone. hyperinflation. Like wow. Well, it, he says, he asks, was, he, was JFK trying to fix the department problem or simply eliminate a foreign occupation of the financial sort? And how might the Fed have used the CIA then to kill him five months after? Well, I mean, he did a lot of stuff. He said, we're taking the troops back from Vietnam. They came to Kennedy with Operation Northwoods, and they wanted to stage terror attacks, blame it on the Russians and the Cubans, start a big war. And he war. wasn't having it. And he said, no, we're not going to do that. Right. They wanted to kill U.S. citizens in theaters and stuff and blame it on foreign enemies, kind of like they just did. Wow, interesting. That uh, sounds familiar. Yeah, that's all in Operation Northwoods. So Kennedy, who wasn't perfect, <laughs> kind of freaked out and said, L.L. Lemon, so you're crazy, you're fired. Head of the CIA, you're fired. So he made a lot of enemies. But the last straw was... He was going to start issuing hundreds of billions of dollars of already issued, but he was going to reissue it because it had gone out of circulation. Uh, Lincoln greenbacks from the Civil War, and he started with $5 bills. They've got a red seal on them. doesn't say Federal Reserve note. It says U.S. note. And it's a fiat currency, but it's U.S. government, so there's no debt created to create it. He was like, wait, we pay foreign banks interest to just print money? He, he was smart enough to understand money is just a mode of exchange. Right. And you're, and you're supposed to control it. You know, so that as things expand, you print more, but you don't print too much or, you know. Inflation goes, and all. It, it, exactly. And so that was one of the final things he did. I mean, it was like a month after he signed that, they blew his head off. Uh, and, they, and they did it where everybody in the world knew the government did it. But then they just told the public, no, no, a right. lone guy did that. So that's to answer that question. Interesting. Uh, the JFK, actually, the assassination is November what, 11th. I, forgive me, I'm probably a little off on that. Coming it, up, are we going to do any specials on it? Yeah, I think it's like the 50th anniversary, isn't it? Yeah, it's a while. Uh, it's a big one. Well, the oh, and they've said no one's allowed to be there who doesn't agree. So, 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 so there's no free speech. So we have to go. Yeah. 
Yeah, we do. Yeah, we do. We have to show our faces for sure. The Well, moving on then, a fan of, t of 2012 asks, I have a question pertaining to 9-11. Obviously, this is a little, little dated, but how did the theory of Flight 93 shot down, uh, stated in the final cut of Loose Change, become more popular than the theory that Flight 93 landed in Cleveland, which was the second edition? Why is the former theory considered more plausible now than, than the latter? You know, I produced one of the loose changes. Okay. The third one. There's been like five of them now. Yeah. Uh, and they, we just wanted to go in the third one with things that could be totally proven. Um, but I didn't have, you know, a lot of control over what actually got put into the final product. I mean, I, I, mean, I think it's a good film. Um, and, it, and it asks important questions. But we don't know exactly what happened. We just know the official story has been proven to be a lie. Right. I mean, it's kind of like, um, I mean, there's a lot of different examples out there. We know government staged these things. We know that they had a motive in this. We know what they've told us isn't true. We know the hijackers were trained at U.S. bases. All I know is, is that the, the first responders... Have you ever read anything then on Flight 93? Have you ever read anything about them landing? I mean, I, I you know... Yeah, no, that was in the first like loose change. They talked about... Um, I mean, it, it's a very complex area. They talked about it with different tail numbers being landed at another airport, which did indeed happen. Right. And the people were taken off, put in a NASA hangar. But, the, but again, then I talked to state police and others that said they saw the jet flying and the F-16s were firing missiles. And then wreckage was over eight miles, and the first responders said there was just a crater. There was no plane parts. Right. Uh, so in a black op like this, they confuse it so much that no one is able to ever find out what the truth is. We just know the official story is a lie. That's a good point. Uh, well, there seems to be, from, from Miss Lydia, this next question comes to you, and she says, there seems to be a general view that we can find candidates who have our opinions, that, that back our views. But uh, what can we do to ensure that those running for office get a fair election? I mean, just like in this Ted Cruz, you know, obviously those black boxes then in Houston that Richard was talking about earlier on the show, didn't come through for um, for Dewhurst. So well, from all the experts I've talked to, who like Bev Harris and others, who are real experts in how fraud works, when there's landslides, mm -hmm. the fraud is hard to operate because it's not unified. Uh, the, you know, there's certain areas where they've got old-fashioned fraud in, where the vote counters are just lying about what the results were. There's other systems where they've got machines that skim, or they've got machines that flip. Mm -hmm. But landslides are hard because you people aren't going to buy it when you cheat it. Uh, but, I mean, what's the question specifically? Uh, I'm sorry. Well, it's, it, essentially, she's asking how do we keep them from being sabotaged? How do we keep these votes clean? Well, that's the big $64 million question. <laughs> the answer is 42. What you've got to do is have it all under local control, counted at the local precinct level, and then publicly posted. Hand counted at micro levels, mm -hmm. put out in a public forum, so that it can then all be publicly counted and put together. Is that something we can unite about? Well, that's the old-fashioned way. That's the way freer elections are done. Now, then they can just threaten people or buy votes like Mexico, but Mexico does it that way. Public rolls with a picture next to who you are. Mm -hmm. It's on the little local precinct level, and then those are publicly posted. Uh, and it's sad the U.S. has one of the most known corrupt systems. It's like we think we're free and have a good system. It's known to be a complete fraud. Some areas have good voting, other areas don't. More than half the country is under fraudulent systems. But what happens is, this is a very complex question, you need to have recall systems via petition to, to, to then have, where the petition states that there will be a recall of the electronic voting machines under state law and that and that, that recall election will be done by paper ballot. And so then you remove the machines. Didn't they do something like that with the, the hanging hanging chads or hanging <laughs> in Florida? Yeah, that was all another fraud, too. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I'm sure there's plenty. But uh, how would you, uh, question, though, how would you start one of those petitions? Like, I mean, aside from just going to your local grocery store with a sheet of paper and asking people to sign it, is there any sort of, I don't know, plan you could put into effect on that? Well, I mean, I can hardly get the light bulbs changed around here. So uh, I'm, I'm putting out general ideas for people out there. I mean, Okay. There are systems that are known to be uh, very hard to uh, manipulate, and it's the system of liberty where you have little local control, and it's and it's a system of where it's publicly counted and publicly posted. All right, people just need to take advantage. And, and then those numbers are added up where everybody can see it happen and verify it. 
Uh, well, this next one, forgive me, I can't say your your username properly. Probably and Noah D. No, Noe D. Sorry. Says both my parents were involved in politics before I was born, and uh, they all have told me stories about undercover infiltration of various movements by security and law enforcement. And you've you know you've touched on that a lot. And I've seen undercover cops myself incite violence. So how do you advise dealing with such people? Um, I, you mentioned actually on the radio show like a couple weeks ago about how these these guys like would jump out of the bushes and light stuff on fire and then accuse you of doing it and you call them out on being you know special forces or whatever it was. Well, no, the guy ran off. And then they had the military show up at the uh, set time to basically blame us for it. Yeah. That's By the, the way, this is know. not product placement, <laughs> but it is. Product. I am so busy. Pollen Burst <laughs> Plus, available at InfoWarsTeam.com. It really is delicious. Uh, which is uh, endorsed by yours truly. They've got my ugly mug on the cover. <laughs> this is the new uh, berry currant flavor. <clears throat> and it is awesome, but actually, I meant to have this earlier, and my throat is dry, so I'm just impromptu product placing uh, <laughs> right now. Well, good. Well, you take a sip, then. Uh, I'll continue a little bit with the question. It says, how would you advise dealing with these people, like those engaged in information gathering, provoking violence, those that hide their true agendas? How do you propose? Well, they always try to get militias that are constitutional and a good thing to meet in secret so that somebody can try to get voted in as the leader who's really an FBI informant or agent. Mm. That's why the federal judge had to release the Hatari. It was all staged. And then they have a big announcement and a big arrest to demonize the American people. I just had cops, Marines in plain clothes uh, at Bilderberg over the years and other things just, just come out and say, hey, Alex, let's attack the State Department. And, and you're sitting there. I mean, they'll come sit down at your table in a I restaurant. I think you're just going to be like, yeah, absolutely. It's, it's, mainly, it's mainly just, it, it's all a big joke to them. I mean, they, I mean they, yeah. most of them have like killed women and children in other countries and think it's cool. I mean, they, you know, they're into being servants of the system. They, they think they're on the winning team. Mm. I mean, they hate this country. Uh, I, mean, I mean, the ones that will do stuff like that. Right. They hate freedom. But the, I mean, or they're cynical and just think evil runs things, so why not wallow in it? And I've had countless plain close cops. I'll be trying to sign DVDs and a movie showing. And then, Alex, I think we ought to kill people. You ought to start killing people. And it's just like, that's what they do. But that's why if you're just out in the open with something, mm -hmm. or if you have a militia, it's a, you know, a historical reenactment thing or a gun club. And then you just train and have some fun. Or you go out and play paintball, you know, which is a simulation of a combat or whatever. But, but more importantly than just training militarily, people need to learn total resistance models. Uh, if people are actually talking about guerrilla warfare to defend their families, if they do start rounding people up and putting them in FEMA camps and stuff, I mean, people are always like, I'll be waiting on them at my house. I mean, if it ever gets down to that, you don't wait for anybody. No, yeah. <laughs> okay, I mean, once stuff like that starts, because, uh, you know, once they're, once they're attacking us, once they're arresting us, once they're going after us, then they've drawn first blood. Then it, it's not offensive to go out first. Right. Once things start, then it's like, oh, now you started? Okay, now, you know, once somebody punches you, well, it's like, now get ready for about 20 punches. But we don't want to get there. We want to fight in the information war. Absolutely up front and first right now because that's what's powerful that's what has an effect we don't want them to trick us uh, into violence but uh, they will sometimes just set people up who are totally innocent and don't just go yeah we all do something we all blow something up you know at the bar right and then they put you in handcuffs right there yeah, and they try to plant a bunch of stuff on you yeah i mean it's but it's even coming out in the news that hundreds of cases they've just whole cloth made it up the groups weren't even planning anything their favorite thing is mentally ill people Bodily retarded people. Easily manipulated. Well, but they'll even actuary and, 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 and oh, what's the word, assess people mm -hmm. that are totally dumbed down. They will even assess and, and psychologically profile people that are just, just on welfare, poor white trash, whatever, just the poorest people. You mentioned we have an info war. I mean, have you, I know you're familiar with the group Anonymous, the hackers group. I mean, uh, how do you feel in terms of how they're waging an info war? It's kind of a spontaneous question. I well, I mean, I'm an anonymous protest. It was always a good thing, but when you say we are anonymous now, that's perfect for provocateurs to go in mm. and do bad things mm. and say, oh, see, anonymous is bad. Because there's no general leader or, like, known. It's yeah, I, I mean, it's okay to do things quietly, but if you are going to do something, you know, legal you know, as a form of protest, then do, but that you don't want to be known, then then don't tell other people. You know, there's almost this, oh, we go have a meeting at the farmhouse, the militia, and we bury guns, and we, we talk <laughs> about things, and there's like three cops at the meeting. Right. And they're the ones trying to get you to, maybe we should attack the courthouse, you know. 
uh, that's what they do. You don't want to be anywhere near that. Yeah. Like I even yeah. saw Hatari militia videos and I said, that stage, they're setting this group up. Out of like thousands of groups, I was able to guess they were setting them up. And it turned out at the time they were, just because I could see the programming. I mean, you can tell when something's staged. Yeah. When Adam Gadon, the supposed head of Al Qaeda, the son of the former head of the ADL, sits there and uploads in the Pentagon's own Intel Center logo, the Al Qaeda logo, and he's going, we, you know, we will attack you American pigs. You will never stop us in the Middle East. And in the meantime, it he's is, putting it on a Photoshop document somewhere else. <laughs> well, well, I mean, it's, I mean it, it's just completely made up as a way to be in the Middle East while real Al-Qaeda works for the globalist. Right. It's, it's just a, it's a, it's an Al-Qaeda simulant. It's a small guy. I mean, everybody. I mean, I mean, it's like decoy ducks out in a pond. It's yeah. just none of it's real. It's all a complete joke. Yeah. Those guys all work at the Pentagon. It's come out they do. Yeah. What's the next few okay, questions? We're almost finished. We've got like three questions left. This one's actually kind of sweet. Janet Astley, actually, she knows you're good friends with Jesse Ventura, and she asked, is he safe? He's living in Mexico, obviously, and there's a bunch of, you know, fast and furious and ca drug cartels, et cetera. I'm just worried about him and his family. I, I think it's just a sweet question. Jesse lives like an hour from pavement in the Baja, and I don't know how safe he is when he drives in in a giant mobile home because he won't fly uh, <laughs> down there. But he does it, and I think he's as safe as anywhere else. Yeah. I mean, Mexico's got really bad pockets of the narco-terrorism and, mm -hmm. you know, where, where the drug gangs are fighting with each other. But Mexico's got a moderately low crime rate in, in, in certain pockets, and he's in one of those. Good. Well, that's good, Janet. You can rest assured. The next one's actually from Daniel, and he says, I watch the show all the time, and I'm constantly... Uh, seeing you promote the solar pack, which is a great form of emergency power, but have you ever considered free energy? And he lists uh, the work of John Bedini, which is, I guess, 40 years ago, John created a very simple um, system that harnesses negative energy to be transformed into positive, usable energy. Like, have you looked into this like a little further, or what do you think? I don't know about that particular person, mm -hmm. but free energy stuff is a bottomless pit of con artists and people. I gotcha. It doesn't mean there aren't universities and private groups that have come up with big systems, complex systems, you know, that produce power. The big problem is how to harness it. Well, and, and batteries, I mean, you have to save it too. Like the, the part of it, you can capture it, but you can't store it. I mean, I've got some solar at my house as a backup, but it's also an affordability issue. Just during you know, bad times, I could get certain things running. Mm -hmm. um, but, and, 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 and th there has been a suppression of alternative energy, and there is some real systems. But when you hear free energy, right. uh, you know, look out. Or when you hear, I'm not knocking the person, but negative to positive. I mean, what does that even mean? I right. mean, energy is energy. I mean, unless you're talking about emotional energy. Well, he might be talking about electrons, too, because, like, you know, in the voltage Positive and, 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 and negatively. Yeah, well, they can say you can have two of those. And they, those I mean, I, I'm not really an expert on it. I just know that... That there's been a major move to suppress it, but then there's also people that discredit it always coming out with, oh, you know, I've been seeing this for 15 years. Mm -hmm. If everybody would just invest, then when this company goes public, everybody will get one of these free machines at their house. <laughs> Makes and, and, that Africa scam. And then it okay. never happens. Right. And then, and then the people I'm telling, you know, it's a scam, they, ne they get mad at me when they get ripped off that I was right. I thought of Prince of Ubu or whatever he died, right? Or he was thrown into. Well, yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I mean to go back <laughs> to that. Tune into a previous I, I, Alex for that. <laughs> I, mean, I mean, well, let's talk about Prince of Ubu. Come on, <laughs> you can't talk about. I know your besties. That's you can't you, you can't talk about Prince of Ubu and not cover it. Right. No, I mean, I remember like the last 12, 14 years, you get these Nigerian letters. Yeah. And people I knew would get one and. They would get very impressed talking to Prince Abubu's representative. There may be a meeting tomorrow. Can you, if, if you would just wire 4,000, then Prince Abubu can wire you the 10 million and he'll be waiting on the, and then finally, finally you, you know, you, you give Prince Abubu the, the you know, the, the $5,000 or whatever, to, you know, they want. And then you get the phone call. But, oh, but then a Prince Abubu has been arrested. He needs 10,000 to get him oh, out. And no. then, but he, he's so thankful 25 million will be sent. <laughs> And you don't want to admit you've been conned. It's kind of like this too big to fail with the banker's works. Yeah. So you just keep going along with it. And oh. then pretty soon, uh, the, 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 you know, the phone numbers change. You can't talk to Prince Abubu anymore. Of course. And then it's just like, you know, like you have a little photo of him up on your wall, though. <laughs> oh, the Prince Abubu, someday I'll get my $25 million. And then they're like, I even had some crazy talk show host once. I won't even get into it. It's just... He was on air announcing, I have just been given, you know, $15 million or whatever it was, offer by Nigeria 
And it's a payoff of the New World Order. And I like called him up and said, dude, that's a Nigerian scam. He's like, you must be involved in the payoff as well. <laughs> and I was just, he was like, I've got my 15 million. It's like, it's like, my <laughs> ship came in. I'm getting 15 million. Yes. Don't you talk bad about Prince Abubu. <laughs> and I'm just like, okay. <laughs> Hail Prince Abubu. <laughs> Hail the Federal Reserve. Hail the world government. They love us. I'm just going crazy. It's all good. Well, uh, the last question, actually, Alex, we got to wrap it up because he's got to get to his haircut. But it comes from uh, Macapod. Oh, I do. I look at this. Mac Macapod. Yeah, there you go. Just, you know, fluff it up. Stop Total it. trendiness. There you go. <laughs> yeah, spot on. Anyway. Uh, it says, Dear Alex, what do you think of the Church of Scientology? It's totally transition here. It, is it just a way of recruiting people to the New World Order? Is it some kind of splinter group that's gotten an edge in mainstream? Like, what, what are your thoughts? I think they do a good service, just like Prince of Boo Boo does. <laughs> <laughs> Very noble of you. Uh, Very noble. Oh, my God. I, I got bigger fish to fry than the yeah. Scientologist. Um, Absolutely. I mean, it is intriguing reading. I'll see some of it on the line. I'll go. I'll see stories about it. And it's just like crazy. This reported <laughs> pension of always locking up all the employees. <laughs> like, oh, you like trying to lock my ass up and something? You're gonna get your ass kicked. No kidding. I mean, you know, I mean, uh, it 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 doesn't look too good. Uh, so, I, again, I don't want to get into it because then they do good stuff like talk about Big Pharma. That is the big giant mafia doing the big problem. So I don't. It's so weird that here's the deal. I've got to stay focused on the big new world order that's trying to forcibly inoculate kids nationwide. Right. Uh, but I did this weekend for like two hours, started reading all these Village Voice articles about it. Mm -hmm. And it was, it just got wilder and wilder and wilder. Village and it was almost a good example for of those of us that love liberty, that the FBI and the CIA are so scared of them because they will infiltrate and do all this stuff right. to you. Right. Uh, that imagine if just people that wanted liberty got aggressive. I mean, I'm not saying infiltrate and do all that so stuff, but imagine if, well, well, yeah, I mean, all I got to say is they got okay. big, gigantic, uh, Huevos Rancheros. Well, they've got a few, like, really, like, Tom Cruise, you know? I mean, he went crazy, and everybody still loves him, like. But then I just thought about, because, you know, I know Charlie Sheen and Martin Sheen and all them, and they, you know, they, off record, I'm not going to get into all of it. Tom Cruise lived with them for a while. Oh, really? And, you know, back before, when he was first starting making it big. Mm -hmm. And uh, he was like, you've got to come and join this, or I won't be friends with you anymore. And then you said, well, goodbye, Tom. <laughs> but I don't know if that's ever been told before. Maybe turning I should. Key, yeah, yeah. But I mean, then I was reading in the Village Voice and the photos, that insider. Uh -huh. It was like how incredible he had to have all the wood in the in the excursion perfectly ready. And oh, and this just, it just sounds like a nightmare. Yeah, wait. I mean, what the hell, man? <laughs> I mean, I, I want money and stuff so I can be left alone and not have a bunch of fancy crap and not be worried about it. Absolutely. You know, but I've got enough where I just want to be comfortable. Yeah. I mean, imagine just like glistening and, and like, like Tom's coming to one of the sites, so everyone's out hand planting. Frosting uh, things with diamonds. Uh, yeah, we have flowers, <laughs> so it's a magic experience. And, oh, it's so wonderful. I mean, it sounds like hell on earth. And that's what these globalists, <laughs> that's what these globalists are into. Because, I mean, l listen, here's the deal. I've had a chance to get to know quite a few Hollywood people and stuff. Over the years, they, you know, they like interesting political types. Yeah. And I just, it, and all of them are in little prisons in their houses, but a lot of them are real people. Mm -hmm. But, but it, it, it is a prison. Yeah. That's why they all moved to Austin, because it's not as bad a prison here. People don't... The paparazzi. You know, I, mean, I mean, out in California, it's just like zombie land for yeah. media. I'm done. I'm late. That's I've cool. got a haircut. Okay, thank you. Uh, was that the last question? That was the last question. We there you go, the Scientology. Version. Tune in for more Prince of Boo Boo. No, I'm kidding. Um, thank you all again. Keep those questions coming. No, I'm going to be honest. Alex Scientology, the Nigerian letters, it's all real. Of course, of course. I am fake. You're fake. That, that is real. That makes total sense. All I know is it's just like, <laughs> I am just reaching cl clearness now. Oh, <laughs> Clairvoyance oh. is Keep the questions coming in the Ask Alex group on PlanetInfoWars.com. Thanks again, guys. Till next time. Thank you. Uh,